Hi, Misha here. I just put out a video kind of revisiting the Eurofighter and expanding my original one. And I figured while I was at it, I would do the same for the Tornado. The Panavia Tornado, also known as the Tonka. Got a couple of versions here. This is the original IDS, the Interdictor Strike version. This is a RAF GR4. And then also have the Tornado ADV, which is the Interceptor Patrol air to air version. And this you saw in the other video. But this is a new one here for you. And uh, much like the Eurofighter, this was a joint project. But one that was much more efficient and actually was pretty cost effective. Well, a few things to track. A lot of European nations have been using the F-104 Starfighter in the 1950s and 60s. And around 1968, West Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, Canada, had all kind of formed a committee partnership to try to figure out a replacement for their aging fleets. And they were hoping to have one plane to replace at least a few in service to kind of, you know, cut back. But this was the height of the Cold War, so they couldn't just let it go. Meanwhile, Britain, it had been interested in a variable geometry, or more simply, swing wing aircraft since the early 60s. But it had had not very good luck. First, it kind of worked with France. There was the Anglo, I can't talk, Anglo-French Variable Geometry Project. Started around 1965, where they were working with France, obviously. But this kind of stalled out quickly, and France took their ball and went home around 1967. At the same time, Britain had been working with America, General Dynamics specifically, on a version of the F-111 Aardvark for them, known as the F-111K, which was the export name. Well, through problems with the F-111, this project was cancelled around 1968, kind of leaving Britain high and dry. They needed a new interceptor, they needed a new strike aircraft, so on and so forth. So they noticed the partnership with the European nations, and they uh, said, hey, can we join in? And did so in late 1968. Well, in 69, a few things happened. In March of that year, Panavia GmbH was established in Germany. And in May, a letter of understanding was signed between Britain, West Germany, and Italy. Belgium had dropped out, or would soon drop out, because France tempted them away with the Dassault Mirage. And then Canada pretty much said, you know what, we're across the ocean over here. You're obviously designing something more for the European theater. We're not, we're kind of the odd man out. And also, we don't like all the Euro European politicalness going on, so Canada bailed. The Netherlands would stay in a little longer, but by 1970, they too would jump out. I think the cost and ambition of the project was just getting to be too much for them. They uh, they were just wanting a simple fighter interceptor for defense. They would ultimately go with the F-16. Good on them. Good point. This would leave Germany, Italy, and the UK. And pretty much the last major decision was, should it be a two-seater or a single-seater? There were proponents of each, but ultimately the two-seat design won out. 
plans were drawn up, and it ended up being a partnership between British Aerospace, Messerschmitt in Germany, and Air Italia in Italy. And the first prototype was sketched out, built, and it would first fly in 1974. It would, the first prototype would fly at all in August of that year, and the first RAF prototype would fly in October of that year. They would ultimately build 12 prototypes, or pre-productions, if you will, so each nation could have a couple to test and play around with. Things went well. The test pilots that flew the early versions of the Tornado were very impressed. It's a very smooth handling plane. It only required minor updates and changes from the pre-production to the production models. And in 1976, the initial contract order was signed. Britain was up for about 365. Germany wanted about 325. And Italy would take the balance. Kind of like on the... Um, Eurofighter video, work share was important. Britain and West Germany would each get 42.5%, so 85 total, leaving the remaining 15% work contracts for Italy. But of course, much again like the Eurofighter, different parts would be built in different nations, and then each nation would do their final assembly. For example, on the British planes, Britain would be building the front part of the fuselage, which actually is important when we get to the, uh, the ADV variant. But yeah, that would be what would happen. By 1979, the first production models would be test flown. And in September of that year, the first ones would be given to the RAF and the Luftwaffe. And, excuse me, July of that year. And then, in 1981, September, Italy would get its first tornado. And from there, a training school would be set up in Britain to train internationally pilots for the tornado, including German and Italian. In 1982, this would go into squadron service that year. And the first fully functional tornado, and it was known as the GR1 in, it, in uh, Britain, would be ready to go that summer of 82. And by 83, it would be joined by three, uh, two more for a total of three. And they would go from there. Then they would start converting in England some older Jaguar units. And by 87, the 500th tornado would be delivered to West Germany. So things are going pretty well, pretty smoothly. And this was ready to go by 1991 in the Gulf War. So what do we have here? We have two engines after burning capable. It is a two-seater front pilot rear as weapons officer, also good for training. It is a variable geometry. The wings have a sweep anywhere from 67 to 25 degrees, meaning the wingspan can be going anywhere from 28 feet up to nearly 46 feet, with an overall length of just under 55 feet for the plane. Relatively big and modern, it had a terrain, ground-following radar system, very advanced for the day and time. It was one of the first to have fly-by-wire management. In fact, it had kind of an analog backup, because they just weren't sure if this newfangled fly by wire was going to work. It also was an early user of a digital data bus system. And it was designed to fly fast, and low to come in and that was kind of the doctrine of the day they, they had tried going high back in the 50s but newer missiles and stuff negated that so now they were trying to go low and fly in under radar and that's what it was designed to do as they call it dash in at the target 
it was designed to deliver nuclear weapons or to go behind enemy lines to attack points. And of course, when it was built, the idea was still a Soviet invasion. Of course, that never came to happen, thankfully. <laughs> it was quite fast. It was Mach 2.2 capable. It had a max altitude of about 50,000 feet. And it could lift nearly 20,000 pounds in payload. Interestingly, it had swing wings, as I said. The wing angle was adjusted manually, not by computers, at least early on. And there were a total of four hard points under the wings, so two on each wing. And the ordnance would rotate to keep it pointed forward. There would also be three to four, depending on the model, hard points under the fuselage for even heavier ordnance. This would be cleared to carry nuclear weapons, cruise missiles, bombs, rockets, air to air missiles, but primarily it was a ground attacker, especially in the RAF. About 900 and 92 tornadoes would be built in total. With this being the most common variant. During the Gulf War, 1991, Britain would send 60 GR1s. And they would be used very heavily to attack targets at low levels. Because of this, they were in harm's way and six were lost during that conflict compared to zero for the Jaguar, but of course this was a much more advanced plane than the Jaguar. It was actually a little more maintenance intensive and a little less reliable thanks to its advancements, but on the other hand it had a lot of capabilities the Jaguar did not. So, you know, win some, lose some. Oh, I forgot to mention, the uh, the GR version here the, has two 27mm cannons made by Mauser. They each have 180 rounds each. So that's pretty neat. After the Gulf War and the losses with these flying low, an upgrade program was conducted. Now, the GR-1 was the standard version in the RAF, but there was the GR-1A, which was a specialized reconnaissance version. And they were, there were a few GR-1Bs, which was a special maritime version. But yeah, after this, in 1994, a program was started for the GR-4, which was an effort to adjust the mission envelope from low level to medium level. Also, it took advantage of new technologies to add things like GPS and compatibility in the cockpit with the night vision goggles. The prototype for the GR-4 first flew in 1997 and production would commence, or I should say conversion, because really what they did they had 228 GR1s in the fleet and they would convert about 142 to GR4s. So the conversion and all that would take place between 97 and 2003. So all the GR1s were either just retired if they were older airframes or they would be converted away. The GR-1A would also be updated a few years later to the GR-4A. And really this would continue to see periodic updates throughout the 21st century. It was used again during the um, Second Iraq War. To attack ground targets. And then it was sent to... Well, basically, it was taken out of Iraq in 2009 and then redeployed in Afghanistan, relieving Harriers. And then the quantities of tornadoes were upped in 2010 in Afghanistan, and they would continue to serve there till about 2014. In 2011, a GR-4 squadron would take a very long-range mission to bomb targets in Libya successfully, and that's actually what this model is of. 
That's why it's loaded to, for bear with a pod, missiles, some rockets, long range drop tanks. And really the last major operations, they, these would be taken out of theater, <clears throat> like I said, in 2014 in Afghanistan. And they would start to retire them. Squadrons would either convert to the new Eurofighter Typhoon, or even later, F-35 Lightning. This would take place from about 2016 to 18. The last major use was tornadoes were used to launch cruise missiles in Syria in 2018, so quite recently. Pretty much once they returned from that, it was the end. The last combat mission for the GR-4, GR-4A, in the United Kingdom ended in January of this year, 2019. Then there were a series of kind of farewell flights and things in February and March. And then these were officially retired just a few months ago in April. And that was the end of its record. Actually, it kind of extended longer than it thought. It nearly was retired in 2010. It was pretty much between this and the Harrier. And by the skin of its teeth, the tornado was saved and the Harrier was sent to the dustbin of history. At one point, they thought they might keep these in service till 2025, but it didn't happen. As far as the model here, it's a 172 scale from Corgi. It's pretty articulated. The wings move together. I just have them in the out position because it lets the ordnance show off well. You can rotate the ordnance when you move the wings. You can also rotate the horizontals back here to move them up or down, and they're joined together. The and kind of unusual for a corgi, the cockpit can be displayed open or closed, although the pilots, I don't believe, are removable. And, of course, landing gear up or down. And you don't have to display it with all the ordnance on. On this one, it's all pegged in, so you can have it completely clean or partial or whatever you want, which is pretty neat. comes with a lot of attachment points. It's a very heavy model. Pretty much all metal, except for the ordnance. So yeah, what about the other version? The ADV? This is a different enough aircraft. It is definitely a, a variation. I almost did two videos though, because it's um yeah, different. Remember how I said that each country kind of made their own component and that one of the components the UK made was the front fuselage. That came in very handy with the ADV variant because most of the structural changes they were able to just do by making a different fuselage using the same rear and wing setup, generally speaking. Well, this dates back really to when Britain joined the whole tornado program. The other countries wanted a swing wing, swing roll, interceptor, fighter, striker. And Britain was already thinking about what would replace the English Electric Lightning, as well as the McDonnell Douglas F4K Phantom they were using. They were wanting a true interceptor, whereas the other nations were looking more as an interdictor, striker. They tried to convince Germany and Italy, but no, they just weren't interested. So they kind of put that on the back burner once the IDS version was underway. They pretty much went their own way, and in early 1976... The government 
the funding basically was essentially given for Britain to develop a dedicated air-to-air -air version. And British Aerospace was contracted to build three prototypes. Using the initial IDS version, they would create the ADV version. And the first prototype was rolled out in the summer of 1979 and first flew in October of that year. And then the other two prototypes would fly in 1980. And Really, testing would be protracted not for the plane itself, but for the components used. The first production model, the F-2, would basically come out and fly in 1984, be officially adopted in 85, and the first squadron would be considered fully ready to go by November of 1987. What do we have here? Well, pretty much the same in the back. Two engines. Originally the F2 would use the same Mark 103. Same basic wing setup, although the sweep was adjusted a bit and we'll get into that. The air brakes were made a slightly longer. It's pretty much all the same. Your differences are in the front here. Still have a two-member crew. Front is still our pilot. Our rear is still a weapons officer, but now he's charged with more being a radar officer. That's because this was designed with a very advanced fox hunter radar meant to track incoming bombers it beyond visual range distance range distances very advanced concept for the time very advanced radar most previous interceptors were using ground based assistance this would be wholly mounted in the plane to that end it would be fitted with four medium range missiles under the fuselage and the original F2 version would have two short-range sidewinder missiles one under each wing for defense the idea behind the ADV was to basically fly patrols over the North Atlantic and shoot down intercept Russian bombers to that end they were moved the port side 27 millimeter cannon and replaced it with an extendable fueling probe for air to air refuelings they would keep the starboard side with its 180 rounds but this wasn't ever expected to get close enough this was a missile fighter but the cannon was there just in case lessons from Vietnam They would also fit an extra fuel tank, and that's because of the front section. They made the front part of the body about four and a half feet longer. This would fit the fuel. It would also allow the four under fuselage missiles to fit properly. Otherwise, there wouldn't be enough space. They extended the body out primarily for that then they realized they had the extra space so they added the extra fuel tank this also actually reduced drag and then in the front the radome is a little longer and larger for the new fox hunter system bringing the overall length out past 61 feet so quite a bit longer overall than the original plane It would also have different avionics, computers, software, display. Again, this was meant as an air-to-air -air plane. In fact, it was never cleared to launch 
air to surface ordnance. It was primarily operated over the water, but it could operate over ground too. The F2 was very short lived. Already by late 1985, the F3, which this is here, was being tested. So they only built 18 F2s. The problem was this. The Fox Hunter radar system wasn't ready to go. They kept running into delays and difficulties. So the F2s actually didn't have it. Instead, it just had a concrete or cement block as ballast in the front. But finally with the F3, they were good to go. This had the Fox Hunter radar. And while they were at it, they added the ability to carry up to four sidewinders under the wings for defense. And they went to the Mark 104 engine, which was optimized for high altitude performance. Remember the original IDS was a low altitude plane in the 80s. So it ended up not really having a higher top speed. It was still about Mach 2.2, but it had more thrust. It had a greater acceleration and a more efficient afterburner. So some pretty important updates. The uh, F3 was much more successful. They would build around 147 of these. And the original F2s were first, they were going to upgrade them, but since there were so few of them, it really wasn't worth their time. So as soon as the F3s were available, they took the F2s, they stripped them for parts that were usable, and they put the airframes in storage. They did use them as training conversion planes for a brief time, but as enough F3s became available, they just put them aside. And main production would continue at British Aerospace, later BE, BAE Systems, until 1993. And that was pretty much the end of production. This was exclusively made for Britain. Really, its first combat debut would be in 1990, when they, Britain would send 18 to be stationed in Saudi Arabia for Operation Desert Shield. And then they would be deployed over Iraq for escort and patrol in 1991, Operation Desert Storm. Most would be brought home, but a few would be left for Operation Southern Watch as patrol to enforce the no-fly zone. And uh, then these would be deployed as... Uh, Escorts for other aircraft in 93 to 95 over Bosnia. And then again in 1999, these would be used over the former Yugoslavia. In 1996, there was an upgrade program, CSP, that would install new cockpit displays and other cockpit stuff it also would update the radar system and give it compatibility with newer ordnance newer air-to-air -air weapons general things like that maintenance and, and modernizations gps what have you this was done so that the service life could be extended to at least 2010 because at this time say it with me the eurofighter was behind schedule so the upgrades would continue. There would actually be another round of upgrades in 2001 to get full compatibility because some of the newer missiles were still not working properly with the radar. They One of the new abilities they added was for multi-target tracking and flagging. Made it a little more up to date. But you could tell that it was starting to show its age at this point. Nevertheless, it was deployed in... 2003, during the Second Iraq War, these would fly patrols all over Iraq and do nothing because there was nothing for them to do. They just didn't find any really air resistance. So, with nothing to do, they were sent home. 
These were kept in the fleet and kept up to date. With small upgrades here and there. But we're finally we're retired out. Well, first I'll say that the, the fleet of ADVs was downsized in 2009 to only 12 still operational. And then those were finally retired in March of 2011. That's about it. Again, the role that they were made for, they were pretty locked into it. And there just hasn't been a lot of air-to-air -air combat since the end of the Cold War. This model here is representative of one of the four sent to the Falkland Islands for defense in 1992. Well, I say there were four stations. There were actually 29 airframes served in the Falklands over the years. And they would serve as defenders until 2009 there. Good roll. It's also worth pointing out that in 1993, late year, Italy leased 24 of these from the Royal Air Force to replace its aging F-104s. Yes, it had the, the IDS version, which served as a multi-role, but they decided they needed a dedicated air-to-air -air version, again, because the Eurofighter was behind schedule. So they would lease them. They got their first one in 95. The first batch was delivered complete in 96. The second batch was delivered in 97. And this would actually have the CSP upgrades. So the second batch that Italy was leased were a little better. And they would hang on to these and returning their last one in 2004. They thought about extending the lease, but like I said, the plane was already showing its age. Instead, they leased F-16s from the USA. Again, because the Eurofighter was... Still behind schedule. The only other user was Saudi Arabia, but they didn't find the ADV to be much to their liking, so its service there was pretty short and undistinguished. But that's it. Again, this was pretty much made for the for the RAF. It's a neat variant for sure. I like the, the long nose. It just gives it a very dagger, very aggressive look. I have this one displayed here with the wings swept back. Just because that's kind of where it looks its part. The whole reason for swing wings, it gives you both. Um, when you have a wing swept back like this, essentially forming a delta wing, it gives you very good performance, speed, but it's not very fuel efficient. You go to a straight wing, you get much better fuel efficiency, lower level maneuverability, and general just, you know, responsiveness. So each has their pros and cons. That's why the F-14 is the way it is. So if you have a swing wing, you can kind of set it. Now, like I said, the original IDS version, it was all manual. But when they went to the ADV, it became more automated, more computerized, setting the wings. Which, you know, one less thing for the pilot to have to worry over. I have it set in a relatively clean configuration. It has the airstreak or sparrow missiles underneath which are the long range kind of offensive missiles well medium range technically but they were its offensive capability they're four they're kind of semi-recessed under the fuselage these come on the model plugged in but for the wings you have options you can either display it more clean like this with just two on each wing for the sidewinders or if you want you can display it with uh, fairy tanks Here, and they have the missile. the The pylon can actually support a ferry tank and two missiles. You could actually even plug all four in because there are four hard points on the wings because they're using the same wing as on the uh, GR1, GR4 models. Uh, but that's not correct, and they don't really fit very well. 
but you could put all of them on the wings if you really wanted to load her down, but that's not really to spec. I like it set up like this because it gives it that sleek appearance. But yeah, it was never really meant to be a dogfighter. It didn't have the maneuverability, agility of a superiority. It was an interceptor, so... It did its job, but it was meant to do very well. It was a very advanced aircraft. This really was considered one of the most, or not the most important European aircraft designs, both of them, the IDS and the ADV, to come out of Europe in the late 20th century. It was a collaborative effort that actually worked. It saved money. Even though the ADV was very specialized for exactly what Britain needed, it would use 80% of the same parts as the standard version. So, very efficient, very well done. And even the IDS was able to replace several other models in um, West German and Italian service. And while it wasn't quite as durable as some of the other planes for its day, it was very advanced, and it was still very flyable and didn't give major things and the main thing is it was produced on time and within budget at least within reason so even though today the Tonka is retired out I'd say it's a you know very important very iconic plane throughout all of Europe if only the Eurofighter program had gone as smoothly alrighty guys hope this extended look was fun if you could like share and subscribe and also, if you want, check out some of my other videos. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.